to welcome Tony Mattelli. The mystical and poetic realism of Mattelli's sculptures takes many forms. From the earliest weed sculptures that remind us of the resilience of the pesky plant life, to the gravity-defying persons, flowers, and ropes, and most recently the aged garden monument shrouded in fruits, vegetables, and meats of varying degrees. The visual weight of his sculpture is often met with a lyricism that is once playful and sincere with a meticulous craft and vision. Focusing on themes of time, ambivalence, banality, and wonder, Mattelli's work challenges the physical laws of objects, often being reversed, upended, or atomized. With these deft manipulations of matter and gravity come profound reorientations in perspective and ultimately states of being. Tony Mattelli was born in 1971 in Chicago, Illinois, and now lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. He has had over 40 solo shows, including the Davis Museum, the State Hermitage Museum, and a mid-career survey at Aros Arhaus Kunstmuseum in Denmark. He is currently represented by Marlboro Chelsea in New York City. His work is in numerous public collections that include the Davis Museum, the Cranbrook Art Museum, the Flag Art Foundation, Aros Arhaus Kunstmuseum, the National Center of Contemporary Art, the Cultural Foundation in Ekaterina, Moscow, Russia, and the list goes on. It is my pleasure to be here today to welcome, although virtually, with the same amount of excitement and anticipation, Tony Mattelli. Thank you. Um, this is an incredibly strange way to uh, do a lecture. Um, typically, I like interacting with the audience and seeing people out there. Um, and in this case, I don't even know if you can hear me. <laughs> so uh, it's it's very strange. So forgive me if my uh, cadence gets weird and um, I stammer a little bit. It's going to be easy for me to lose my place because I'm sitting um, in my living room, and uh, that's also very very weird for me, uh, as it is I guess for you guys too. So <clears throat> um, this lecture, I decided to. Um, make a more focused lecture than I typically would. Usually I give an overview of everything I've done, but in this particular lecture, I'm gonna focus primarily um, on the figurative work. Uh, and in doing that, I am going to talk about my transition from being um, very interested in narrative uh, and allegory uh, into where my interests lie now. <clears throat> and all of that can be tracked through um, my work with the figure. Uh, and so here we go. Let's see if I can share my screen. All right, bear with me. Okay, here we are. I hope you can see that. I'm gonna try and move, there we go. All right, <clears throat> I hope you guys are with me here. Like again, I can't hear a thing and uh, um, I hope you can see this and I hope you can hear it. Okay, thumbs up from someone in the audience there. Excellent, thank you. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in an area um, in Wisconsin that uh, was the birthplace of uh, something called Dungeons and Dragons. So the creator of D&D lived down the street from me. I became friends with children, not, not his kids, but other kids who were working at that um, gaming company. And I got very into uh, D and D, and also other kind of uh, miniature games. And these miniature games, and even D and D, <clears throat> what happens with them? You you get an accompanying figure, and um, or avatar, I guess. And this figure or avatar um, represented you throughout the game, and you would use it to track your uh, progress on a map, um, and um, and various other kind of uh, physical situations. But it was essentially your avatar. And you would buy them in a package like this. This is one uh, riding knight by a company called Ral Partha. Uh, and then you would buy it, you would paint it, and you would bring it to these, to these games. And a lot of people took uh, plenty of pride in their painting skills um, and their modeling skills. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, uh, can I get this to work? There we go. Uh, after getting involved in that, I quickly got into uh, other types of modeling. This is a diorama. It's not my own, but I took this from the internet. This is a diorama of some World War II scenario that someone conjured up in their mind. Um, I got super into this as well. And as a young person, it was really powerful for me to be able to create a miniature world. 
uh, and in in that world, you could control everything. Um, and the, the scale shift, I didn't really think much of it at the time, but the scale shift gave you a greater sense of control. You know, the smaller it was, the larger you were, the more omnipotent you felt, and so on and so forth. Um, and I got really, really deep into this world. Uh, this is a contemporary version of a game called Warhammer. It's still going on, apparently. I don't play this game, but lots of uh, people are still doing this, and the figures act in the same sort of way. It's world building. Here's another really excellent looking Panther tank, or Tiger One tank, uh, 172nd scale. And in doing that, I didn't realize it at the time, but what I was really doing was making sculpture and getting deeply involved into what narrative sculpture was. Um, and if you blow up a sculpture of this size to life size, what is that? Is it a toy? Maybe not. Is it a sculpture? Most definitely, yes. Um, so that was my, I think, the roots of my interest in, um, in sculpture itself. Uh, something that could represent a theme that was going on that took up physical space, that was knowable, um, and you could, you could uh, get, it, it, it was knowable and it was also involving, all involving, you know, because it took up that space uh, and it had a kind of uh, allegory or narrative that accompanied it. Um, this is a sculpture by Dwayne Hansen. It's called The Janitor. Uh, and this was, this is currently in the Milwaukee Art Museum. This is one of the very first art experiences I've ever had. Um, I remember walking into the pop art wing of the Milwaukee Art Museum. And uh, in this same room, there was an Alex Katz. There was a um, Alice Neal. Um, uh, what else was there? Uh, um, um, uh, Chuck Close, and a couple other things. But this really, really startled me when I saw it. When I saw this, everything else in that room felt as though it was just a sign. It was just a signal pointing to something else. This felt like it was the thing. So everything else in that room was almost a theatrical representation of an idea. It wasn't an idea. It pointed to an idea. And this sculpture, to me, at that time, as a young boy, felt like the idea. There was no distance between what it was, what it was representing, what it was about. It was all smashed into one dense piece of art. And I can say that now, uh, but I knew it then. I wasn't able to say it then, but I knew it then. I felt it with my body. There was a kinesthetic experience I had that was beyond just looking at it. Um, and looking at it now, I know, you know, I have a different experience. But that art experience stuck with me um, very deeply. Now looking at it, you, you, you can, I see all the problems with this sculpture. Um, but at the time, if I look beyond that now, even I could see what's so cool about it. It's in a, um, it, it, it's representing something you're never supposed to see in an art museum, first of all. That's, I think, probably where the art lies within this particular work. Um, you're never supposed to see the infrastructure of an art museum. You're just supposed to see cleanliness. You're never supposed to see the people actually doing the labor of cleaning. Museums are um, platonic spaces, in a sense. Um, so anything like this person uh, violates that, uh, the, it, the um, primal structure of, a, of the museum logic. Uh, and I like that about it very much. Um, <clears throat> this is a self-portrait by an artist called Ivan Albrecht. And this also was a very early art experience for me. It, this is a painting that's at the um, School of the Art Institute. And I think the School of the Art Institute has probably the majority of Ivan Albrecht's work um, because he was a Chicago native and you know wasn't really that famous outside of the region. But there was something about this piece too as a child that I knew spoke to me really deeply. Um, and I felt then, as I feel now, the anxiety 
in the painting, the, the uh, nervousness in this person's face. I wish I had a close up because the way these are painted is so fastidious and so it's just so jam packed full of detail. And there is um, a very uneasy psychological uh, component to this work. And I'm showing you these things because I think that this is what, these are the foundations of what I'm interested in, not just with the figurative work, but in general. Um, so from that, I think we go into my first artwork here, um, what I would call my first artwork. And this is uh, a piece called My Soul Searching Has Finally Paid Off. And I consider it my uh, very first self-portrait. Um, at the end of this lecture, I'm going to show you a work in progress. So all of this is kind of leading up into the very final few slides I'm going to show you, which is what I'm working on now. And I very rarely do this, but um, since this is a strange circumstance, I thought I'd show you something that is taking place in the studio right now. Um, but anyway, this is uh, my first self-portrait, and it represents me as um, an open box. <clears throat> Not just open, but also empty. Um, and this was made at the very end of graduate school. And I was confused as to what direction I wanted to take my art and what direction I wanted to take my life. And I felt, um, I felt like this piece functioned as a kind of uh, manifesto or a kind of, uh, a kind of um, declaration that uh, I was going to be open to new ideas uh, and ready to accept anything. This is um, a sculpture called Seals. And this kind of goes back to my thinking of those dioramas, my first experience with those dioramas, trying to figure out a way to represent a narrative um, in a way that I felt was uh, contemporary and, um, and, and new for me. So I wanted to take this feeling of, uh, of a tragic image, but also an image of tenderness and love uh, between a mama seal and a baby seal who are um, inevitably going to die in this pool of in this oil slick. And I wanted to amplify this feeling of tenderness by representing its opposite um, its opposite force. So <clears throat> for, for me, the the idea is that representing if you, if you want to talk about love or tenderness, a great way to do that is to show its, its um, opposing force because it, it um, then just heightens everything, everything else. Um, and this is rendered in a kind of um, disnified, mediated style. And I wanted to do that too because this is how I was receiving all of these kinds of images of tragedy. Like when I was young, the images of the uh, Ethiopian famine were everywhere on TV and everywhere in Time Magazine. You would experience that tragedy through the mediation of gloss, the glossiness of the TV screen, the glossiness of the, the pages in a magazine sandwiched in between these, these kind of uh, crass commercial images of advertisements or whatever else. So I wanted to give this that um, equal amount of mediation through the stylization of the of the rendering here, and this is this is also made at the tail end of uh, graduate school. Uh, this is my first show in New York, um, and taking the logic of that the sculpture of the seals. I made a scu this sculpture on the left here called Lost and Sick, which is the sculpture I'll be talking about next. I wanted to make a sculpture that was about, uh, that was about rejection, a sculpture that uh, emphatically declared no with an exclamation point. And I got to thinking what, what would be the best what would who would be the best people to depict that with you know and and boy scouts to me are the image of um societal indoctrination um 
And also Boy Scouts represent a transition in life, a, a change from being a child to a young adult to a, to a man. So you have Cub Scouts, you have Weeblos, you have Boy Scouts, and they all represent this transition of life and a transition from being a child to being a mature adult, a mature citizen even. And I wanted to uh, represent a, an upheaval of all of those kind of ideas. I didn't want to participate in society in the way that other people that society wanted me to participate in, as a matter of fact. You know, I didn't want to hold a job. Uh, I didn't want to get married and have kids and have a house, you know, at the time it, that all seemed crazy. So this was, my way of saying that I don't share those this, the the prevailing morality, and um, I was thinking about this idea idea of rejection, and the ultimate rejection is vomiting, right? It's a it's a literal rejection. It's a physical uh, manifestation of that idea. So that's how that's how the idea of these Boy Scouts being um, not only lost but also sick came about. Um, and again, it's rendered in that same kind of um, mediate, hyper mediated, uh, almost doll like uh, way um, that I had been that I essentially grew up with as as a model maker. And you have a young one who's kneeling down. He's in the worst stage. You have the the slightly older one who is who is uh, bent over, uh, who is in in less pain. And then you have the eldest one who is uh, still pretty pretty lost and sick. So th three stages of failure here. Uh, after that work, I became a little less interested in that type of uh, the that type of uh, I guess that aesthetic, that toy aesthetic, and I wanted to have the figures located elsewhere. You know, maybe more in our own space. So I got rid of the diorama floor. I wanted these the, the new figures to kind of share our, our space. Um, and that, I guess, comes from loving that Dwayne Hansen so much uh, and thinking so much about that, that I wanted there to be no more distance between the, the viewer and the, um, the, the artwork. I wanted to try and collapse uh, that space. So after that, after my first show, I was a little lost and didn't, didn't know quite um, where to where to go with the work again. So I made this sculpture called Sleepwalker, which is something that I felt um, really captured my my um, mood at the time. This is also a work that works really well with with other sculptures around it or other other artworks around it too, because it seems to um, it seems to then have a conversation with those those other works. This is the first piece I did that, that, that I guess besides the weed series, that really felt situational. That it felt like it was um, at home anywhere you would put it and also seamless with that environment. This would be at home in the museum. It would be at home in someone's front lawn. It would be at home in someone's hallway because the circumstances would always be the same. It would always be lost. It would always be out of place. Um, you can't hang one of these photographs uh, on, a, on a tree outside, you know, but you could put the sculpture anywhere. So that one, of the, one of the problems with making um, figurative artwork or a figure sculpture like this is that you run up against the inevitable questions of portraiture. Um, who is this a portrait of? Who is this you? Is this a friend? Is this someone else? Um, so that became pretty frustrating for me. And um, I, I wanted to try and figure out a way out of that. Here in the rendering, you can see, still see it's pretty stylized. You see the hair is still sculpted. So it still retains a kind of um, uh, sculpture quality. You know, it's not really trying to fool you. It's just trying to fit in a little better. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I've abandoned that idea of a diorama landscape and situated this thing in our own space. So one way I thought about um, uh, eliminating the problem of portraiture and that, that trap of representing a real person was to uh, use a stand-in. And the, the best stand-in I could think of were uh, chimpanzees. Um, because chimpanzees are always used as stand-ins for 
uh, humans, whether it's uh, clinical drug trials or, uh, you know, Geico commercials. Um, whenever you see a, a, a chimp doing something, you immediately think of a human doing that, that activity. It was also a really great way to talk about human nature and um, ancient kind of um, uh, impulses that, that humanity, that's embedded within humanity. Um, so it's kind of a two for one as far as that goes. So this is a chimpanzee version of that uh, sleepwalker sculpture. And I guess since no one's shouting out questions, probably people are probably wondering what materials are. So I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and, and say that while I'm, while I'm moving here. This is mostly made of fiberglass. The head is made of, um, of uh, silicone and the, the hair is all um, just implanted hair. This is a series of self-portraits. I return to self-portraits pretty often, actually, uh, more than I would say, more than anyone I really can think of. Um, and I, I like that idea for a variety of reasons, but this is the first proper, um, re really big series of self-portraits I made. Um, in the middle, you have a sculpture called Wanderer. To the right is a sculpture called Reverie, and to the left is a sculpture called uh, The Hunter. And here I'm returning to that uh, diorama idea with just a slightly different, um, aesthetic shift, visual shift. Uh, and I wanted to play out a whole scenario here. So I wanted to represent myself in like three stages. One, a, the stage of seeking and hunting. One, a stage of aimless drifting. And one, a stage of um, satisfaction and, uh, and reverie. Um, and I saw those kind of as three stages of life, you know? And these are also kind of all cribbed from our history. I don't, I don't know if I love this series now looking back on it, but, um, but, it, but it did do some things that are, are pretty interesting at the time anyhow. Um, so these three figures are isolated on the gallery floor and then around them is this horizon line, an endless horizon line. And that kind of located these three figures on an island of their own, um, the only humans you encounter. And I like that it became a kind of weird, um, fun house, you know, like the, the faces are all caricatured. Um, the heads are all kind of enlarged and car caricatured. And I think that whenever you uh, endeavor to make a self portrait and you look at yourself in the mirror for a little while, or you're alone with yourself for a period of time, that has a kind of distorting um, effect on, on, on one's self image and one's psyche, I think. Um, so I was trying to capture that kind of feeling of um, uh, self-alienation or uh, kind of uh, um, distance from oneself. Here is a, um, a few years later, I think this is 2000 and I, I don't know what this would be, maybe 2003. Uh, and you, I was now finally able to show that Matelli box. This, my soul searching has finally paid off. But I've remade it for this show. In the background is a sculpture called Total Torpor Mad Malaise. And that also, incidentally, is another self-portrait. So here, I guess, uh, in the foreground here is a sculpture called Yesterday. But in the background, you can see the, um, the full Total Torpor Mad Malaise. It was done in two versions. This is the Swedish version, and there's a German version. And that They're called that because they each went to different locations, one in Sweden, the other in Germany, obviously. Uh, and you see that I've held on to the diorama aspect a little bit, yet it, I've abstracted it somewhat. Um, it's still kind of in situ. It's a hybrid, let's say. And again, think back to that uh, Ivan Albrecht painting I made, uh, I showed you, sorry. And I drew on that fairly heavily with this piece, or at least the vibe of that, of that work. And I wanted to convey a sense of um, anxiety and depression, but also of uh, stoicness 
and uh, resilience. I try in almost all of my work to have a, um, a psychological component to it. In fact, that's the reason for these things to be. I'm not interested in figure sculpture at all, really. I think that that might be obvious. Although maybe not obvious to you seeing this particular lecture, but um, it's not a main interest for me. Uh, I use the body just because it's there. Um, and it's through which we have all of our feelings and through which we do all of our thinking. So um, it, it, it just happens to be present, you know? Um, I also try to convey these same feelings in, in, um, in other objects too, but uh, we're just focusing on the figure in this particular slideshow here. Here's the German version, and uh, you can see it's just much more brown, much, much, much uh, shittier. And I feel that the, the, the way the hair is combed over the, the head gives this sense of, um, of uh, pride that is left in, this, in this, this figure, in this person. And also the pose is a, a very classical Greek kind of pose. And he's he's leaning on a, a stack of like uh, Victoria's Secret catalogs and probably a couple of Hustler magazines and stuff like this, like low level middle class uh, quasi porn material. So these are all pretty intense interventions in the figure. Uh, to this point. Now returning to the to the chimps, this is a sculpture called Ancient Echo. And I wanted to revisit that same impulse I had with uh, the lost and sick, the vomiting Boy Scouts in their in their little landscape. And so this is uh, the the chimp version of it. I don't I don't think of it as uh, equational in that in that way really, but but uh, that's essentially what it is. And there are three different versions of this one. This one is wearing a, uh, an American Express shirt. Uh, let's see if we can have a, if we have a picture of that. Yeah, so you can kind of see it there. He's wearing an American Express rewards shirt. Uh, there's another one with a Think Different shirt. And there's an, another one, I think, with another banking shirt. Like kind of, kind of corporate, ch cheery corporate um, advertisements. Now I, I uh, made a female version of the sleepwalker and that's this one here. And you can see that um, I'm trying now to increase the neutrality in the, in the presentation of these works. I want them to feel more and more without any type of intervention. Like I said before, the total torpor is quite an intervention and quite a sculptural intervention. And um, I'm becoming less and less interested in that type of um, that type of uh, artistic. Um, I guess I guess uh, intervention is the right word, but it's there's another word I'm searching for. But I'm becoming less and less interested in that way of working, and more and more interested in a kind of a much simpler way of conveying uh, a mood. Um, so. Here, Sleepwalker is pretty straightforward. And in the foreground, you can see um, a couple uh, sculptures from my Weed series. So this one now is wearing real underwear where the last one had sculpted underwear. Uh, this one has actual hair where the other one had sculpted hair. So you feel much more in the room with this particular figure, but it's still not quite it's, I wouldn't call it hyper real by any stretch of the imagination. This is still sculpture. So here is that sculpture and you can see total torpor mad malaise in the backdrop there, background. And behind her is a, a, one of my mirror paintings which um, I guess I won't be talking about in this lecture, but I, in the questions, if you 
want to mention anything else, we can talk about that. Uh, these are somewhat out of sequence, so I apologize for that. This is a sculpture called Fucked. Um, again, another chimp version of, um, of, of a feeling I was trying to convey. Um, let's see if I can go backwards here, hang on. So, so when I was thinking about this piece, I was really thinking about um, perseverance uh, rather than agony and pain. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that in the very, very background there, you can see a little dot on the floor. That's an arm, his arm, his severed arm. So what that does is it creates a, a forward movement of this figure. So you, you may imagine that the figure, this sculpture is about one thing, but it's really, I think, about another thing. And that other thing is about perseverance. So the way this is set up in this building you're, you, you enter the building and you almost immediately encounter this figure. And way, way in the background is that arm. So he's almost out of, the, of this um, exhibition space. So uh, there's a kind of imminent escape for him. Um, so it was really about capturing that, um, that trajectory of, of this, this walking figure. And again, it's a kind of St. Sebastian um, riff, I suppose, although that, that was not really in my mind here. It was also another way to just see what, how much I can jam into a very small area. You know, if you think about this formally, it's a very small thing and there's a lot of stuff smashed into it. And um, I was careful not to make it feel violent, although it's an, it's an image sort of of violence, but it's pretty abstracted and it's, and it's pretty playful in that, in that violence. It's almost, I guess this is made at, a, at like a Tarantino kind of um, time period. Um, so the, the violence could get amped up, but still feel quite light. And there's the arm you see in the distance. Again, there's no real gore factor in that. So this is a, a work called Fucked Couple. And this is uh, the human version of that last piece, let's say. And again, like the seals that you saw very, very early on in this slideshow, I wanted to talk about romantic love in a way that didn't feel completely hackneyed or completely corny and that somehow I could give new um, life to this feeling of like a, a romantic relationship. Um, and again, the, using the same logic as very early on, um, one way to do that is to represent um, its calamitous opposite. So here I got um, full Warner Brothers and, and had a piano drop on their head and, and really took the cartoon violence um, up a notch. Um, and this, I would say, is probably my loudest work um, and like the, the most hot of all the works. And from here, um, you'll, you'll notice that there's a, a change in tone. And if I was showing you the full lecture, you would see that in the other objects as well. We could maybe revisit some of those other slides once we're done with this. But uh, so this is Fucked Couple. All of these works, uh, incidentally, there are, there are usually three of all of these works because I work in additions. So to make this is so labor intensive and so costly for the mold making uh, and for the casting and the painting and everything else that um, to make it financially feasible, you need to sell uh, three so that you spread that um, fabrication costs over three rather than just one. Because I would have to uh, sell this for such an expensive um, amount. It would be so costly to sell no one would buy it and it would it would um yeah i wouldn't be able to recoup any of that money um so here again you see that they're exiting um so that was really what is important about this work that you see a trajectory to their path um And if 
I don't think I have a detail. But there's an arm tattoo that says um, true love forever on his arm. It's a little corny, but but uh, I thought it was a kind of a nice detail. Uh, okay, so this is a few years later. I think this is 2007. Um, there's a sculpture to the left. It's called uh, Fuck It, Free Yourself. And it's a very beautiful sculpture of a, a, a porcelain $100 bill that's burning. It's kind of... Um, uh, eternal flame, let's say, to um, uh, to freedom, let's say, <laughs> freeing yourself of uh, the, the the shackles of uh, being over overly determined by by finances. Um, but in the back, the one I want to talk about is a sculpture called "Old Enemy, New Victim," and that is the um, the next chimp sculpture. But you could see that the, the tone of this work is quite different than the last and the way that it's rendered is very different than the last. This is done um, with a lot more attention to detail, a lot more attention to the um, way the figures are moving. It's a much more complicated work than the previous chimp sculptures. Um, it's uh, in many ways a much more accomplished work, um, just technically. But I think that there is also just a, a tonal difference. There is the, the humor that was in that earlier work has been removed um, so that I think it plays much more um, evenly, much more cleanly, which is what I was talking about a little bef bit before also about getting away from style, getting away from that kind of mediation between the idea and, and the work itself and cleaning everything up. So I wanted to get rid of that humor, get rid of the silliness of some of that earlier work and make just a very serious, neutral um, work. Now, I know there's still a lot of narrative involved in this. This is still an allegorical work. I haven't sucked that out yet, but the trajectory is moving in that direction. So this is made of um, silicone and lots of other materials, but, but but materials that would be at home in a special effects world. Okay, so this, is, let's see here, what do we talk about? So in the back is another self-portrait, it's called Meathead. Uh, to the left is a, f a figure, he's kind of laying on the ground, it's called Josh. And to the left of that uh, is a, one of the mirror paintings. I think that's called Fuck Off. And reflected is another mirror painting from across the room. In the center is a work called Yesterday. Um, those are those uh, House of Cards sculptures. They're all called Yesterday. So here I would say is the first exhibition where I've really pared everything down. I've, um, I would say moving into another phase of, of my, uh, um, my artistic, of the I mean, another phase of the realization of these works um i've i've more or less eradicated or or or, or taken the humor out of this work m taken a lot of the narrative out of this work and the interest now is just to create a clean and clear um image and uh, i've become more interested in the image quality of these pieces so uh this is the back of the meathead, and this is it's kind of cartoony still, but um, but it's rendered in a very different way than say uh, fuck couple was like there it these feel much more of our world and and less of a of a cartoon world. Um, it's a it's it's like a self portrait rendered in meats obviously. This is the back of it looking forward, and so this is this is the two of them. On the left you have the fresh version. On the right, you have the rotted version. So what I was trying to do is just convey a um, time lapse, essentially. So if you have the left one of fresh meats, to the right, you have the it's collapsed version of rotted meats. I was I was interested in 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 speaking about a kind of resurrection or a kind of um, Christian narrative of of uh, a, a romantic narrative where to. Uh, um, reinvent yourself you need to essentially uh, have like an ego death then you can be born again in that morning as a new person it's a maybe a buddhist idea right so um 
but I was interested in this idea of becoming a new. Uh, um, and so that's really what these works were about on the left. So it's the fresh one on the right. It's all rotted, but what you have is the fresh life of the maggots then growing on it. And this is iterated in different ways in different works. So well, let's see if there are any details here. This is all made of uh, tinted urethane and uh, painted bronze. And that that um, the tin foil over the cardboard there is all um, aluminum, polished aluminum. I think I think there's kind of let's well, just focus on this for a second. I think that there's kind of a um, there's a transformation an object takes when, when you reproduce it, it becomes something else, you know, like it, it and I mean that it becomes philosophically something else. Um, you're not just left with a reproduction of something. You're left with a whole, um, a, a new sp spiritual object in a way. Like this, this thing is imbued now with a philosophy that the original, I couldn't just make this out of meats, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, first of all, it wouldn't last, but it also wouldn't have the physical presence that this does, even if it was ex looked exactly the same. I think that, that um, in reproducing something, it turns, it, it, the thing goes through, um, I don't know, like, uh, it's almost a, a transformation. It becomes a, a philosophical object rather than just a thing. This is why I rarely um, use like a ready-made because I don't think it goes through that transformation. You could feel it when you're in front of those things. You could feel the object doing something different when it's reproduced. Um, it becomes more of a speculative uh, entity. That, that sounds um, weird and spiritual, but I believe it to be true. Um, here is a... a vegetable version of that previous sculpture it's called veg head and again this is also a self-portrait um this is a very cool one i think and this is all this is all painted bronze again just trying to get at that idea of um a decay and a rebirth and so here the rebirth is represented in that onion sprouting again I have a I have a Swedish gallery, so this is done on an uh, absolute vodka uh, box, which I thought was kind of fun. This, this is a veg man, again, same same exact principle. This is also self portrait. I use vegetables and meat so much, perishable objects so much in the work because they very clearly speak about this uh, transition of time. Uh, there's, there are very few things in our lives that we're so tuned into, uh, other, uh, more than uh, the freshness of an of a object we're about to eat. Every time you open the refrigerator, you're contemplating, how old is this thing? How fresh is that thing? What is this thing? So that's why I really like using um, fruit or vegetables or meat in the work is because they just implicitly um, have that built into them. Here the, the onion head is sprouting a little bit, or the garlic head, sorry. Again, as the expression of rebirth. Uh, and so, okay, this I would say is now the final transition uh, into what I would call the, the, the attitude of the work currently. Um, where there is no longer narrative necessarily. There's just the, the image of the thing. There's just a scenario in front of you. Um, and um, there's also now very little style in any of this work. And I think uh, moving forward, there's actually very little humor in the work, although, although people find humor in the strangest places. So <laughs> what, who am I to say? Um, this is a this is a work um, again. It's called Josh. And what I was thinking with this work was, again, I was thinking of this um, related to the to the uh, um, veg head and the meat head. This idea of a kind of um, emptying out of ego and of 
personality and all the things that weigh us down in life and all the things that are somewhat out of our control sometimes, the inertia of daily life manifests itself in so many um, weird ways. And I wanted to um, make an image of someone who didn't have any of that, and, um, someone who was almost weightless, uh, almost uh, unburdened by the gravity that the rest of us feel. Um, so I don't see this person necessarily as a levitating figure. I see it as a floating figure or a, a figure untethered, you know, uh, because he's, he's not perfectly levitating. He's kind of keep, kind of all, rolling off to the side. He's a little bit cockeyed. It's not a perfect levitation. There's something very wonky and uh, tentative about it. Um, I wondered if this would be um, a enjoyable place to be or a scary uh, body to inhabit um, what is that what is that intermediate space like um, what it, what is that that state of being neither here nor there uh, I think that about the sleepwalker a lot this way too it's a it's a sculpture that represents two things at once so I'll, I'll talk later about that but this is this I wanted to also represent two things at once um, He's fully awake, his eyes aren't closed. It's almost as though something has taken over him. I mean, you can feel all of that in this sculpture when it's in front of you, but you don't know why. So there's no, there's no proper narrative to it. You don't know why. It's not allegorical. You don't know if it's good or bad. There's no judgment. It's just the image. It's just the thing. And this is, to me, finally, the, the way of working that feels perfectly right for, for me right now. So here is the latest iteration of Sleepwalker. This is, finally, I made this thing appropriate for the outdoors, which is in a way all, where it should have been all along. Um, it, the, it, his displacement and his, um, the, the um, what's the word? The, the, the quality of him being lost is amplified so much with him being outside of the home. This is a person who by every, definition should be inside. <laughs> um, he's half naked, he's wearing his underwear, his eyes are closed. So it's very clear he is in the wrong place. And, um, and so I think that it's at its most powerful here, also in this beautiful landscape. But when I was talking about this operating in, in two ways or it being in two places at once, it's representing a, a body but it is also representing a psyche uh, because this is a man who in fact is in another place this is an unconscious man who who is going about a motor activity you know so it's a it's a person in a fugue state he is in a liminal moment hyper vulnerable very delicate state uh, and that's what i love about about this work that it can can operate in in those ways it can be both present but also completely absent um and that's a very for me a very cool um place for the for a sculpture to exist um and it's a cool place for a human to exist so i originally thought of this work when i was thinking of it outside as being a kind of empathy magnet that everyone would, when they would see it, they would feel immediate, um, immediately for this figure. You know, they would have an empathetic reaction, an emotional reaction to this helpless individual. Now, of course, that isn't how things always play out. Um, but I see this as a, as a sculpture of vulnerability and, um, and also of, of uh, impotence, really.
And so there it is in the high line. Uh, okay. And then I guess this latest body of work called Garden, all these works are, uh, th these are this, these um, concrete statuary figures with perishables added to them. Again, I'm bringing the perishables, perishables back. And I know I, mentioned, I was talking about humor a little bit. People find these kind of funny and, and um, I guess irreverent is a word that, that you could use appropriately, I suppose. But um, I think these are pretty serious and, and quite, quite beautiful works. Uh, although I, I, do, I do get the, the humor in them. Um, so this is a sculpture called Warrior and behind it is a, 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 work, a mirror painting called Eat Shit. Um, I guess I featured that. So here you have a couple other ones. Here you could see those mirror paintings I was talking about before. Again, they're, they're, they, in, in those mirror paintings, I was also trying to talk about a passage of time um, among other things, among other more formal things. But these concrete and marble and bronze um, figures here you see are explicitly, explicitly about um, a passage of time and about a kind of reorientation of your material expectations. You would expect the fruit and the, the cantaloupe and the shrimps to all go bad, however they don't. And you would expect the concrete and marble to remain perfect, however, in this case, they don't either. So it's a way of freezing um, time in, in, in a sense. Um, I was originally going to use um, other objects instead of these statuary pieces, um, but they didn't have the same resonance. They, a, a person didn't have the same emotional connection to the work uh, if they were just, say, a rusty washing machine with a strawberry on top of it. Um, still talking about an end of life and a and a and um, um, apex of life. So I wanted to choose these fruits that were at peak perfection, peak peak ripeness, the the absolute peak of their uh, potentiality. And then these um, ruined garden sculptures that were kind of at the end of their potential. So I just thought that that contrast was very beautiful and very poetic, not to mention the formal factors of the, the colors and the soft, the hardness of the stone and the softness of the fruit. All of those things were really seductive for me. Um, okay. Uh, so you see that suite of sculptures in the front and then in the back you see a sculpture called figure one. And I think we go back there now. So here we have um, on the left figure one, figure two, and a um, untitled piece, uh, which is just a, tang a frozen tangled rope in space. Um, and I've been talking a lot about taking things out of the work, removing narrative, removing humor, removing uh, stylization. And I think this is, this is the, uh, the best example now. This is the most recent work here. Uh, of these inverted figures, because all that was done with these was a simple inversion of the image of a figure. Even the feet are perfectly flat as though they would be standing on the ground. The only intervention I've done is simply rotate that figure upside down. And I think it's incredibly effective and also very, um, it's, it has emotional power still. And I was really, really pleased to, to see that you you actually can get away with very, very little. So the art is not located anywhere but that simple inversion of the thing. However, none of it would work if the craft wasn't perfect. Um, so it's the it's the marrying of those two things, the 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 perfect craft and the very, very simple inversion of these figures, um, which was very, very satisfying and and um, powerful for me. So I, I can see that this room uh, loosely as a sort of Garden of Eden, right? So you have figure one, which is, I guess, this is a, a dumb way to talk about it, but let, let's let's do it anyway. Uh, so you have Adam there, figure one, you have um, Eve, figure two, and then you have the kind of serpent of the tangled rope frozen um, kind of mysteriously in place. And then the column functions as the tree. Now that was just a dumb way for us to talk about it uh, while it was in the gallery. I never conceived of it that way. But when we put it here, it made perfect sense. The show is in fact titled Garden anyway, based on those garden figures that we saw in that other room. So here you see figure one, figure two. 
I think of these pieces as a kind of relationship in the same way I thought of a uh, fucked couple as a relationship. Although these figures are irreconcilable. They're, um, they're kind of forever separated. Um, in, in, and their world is obviously alien. Alien to us. Uh, and these are all made of um, silicone and hair and steel and other internal structures. Um, I mean, that's that's about as beautiful as the sculpture gets, I think. These are in here just for context. I know this is not a figure sculpture, but. And here's the female figure. And there you can see how, how the, the feet retain that, that kind of perfect flatness. If I had a detail, I wish I did, I don't know if I do, of the bottoms because the, the way the capillaries function when there's weight pressed against the skin is very interesting. Uh, all, the, all the blood rushes out. It, it's like super yellow and kind of dead looking. Uh, I don't know if I have a detail of that. Anyway, uh, here are some details of those mirrors. And then these are the, those garden sculptures in detail I was talking about. This is, has green beans on it. You get the idea of these. I'll cycle really quickly through these and then talk about uh, what's in the studio. Um, again, this is all cast concrete and painted bronze. The, 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 the added elements, the, as I, I call them annotations, those are all painted bronze. Um, sometimes they're cast glass, sometimes they're polyurethane, but mostly just painted bronze. This is a very cool one. This has a strange resonance these days, the toppling of those monuments. Okay, and now I think, oh yeah, okay, so this is the last one. Uh, and I'll show you what I'm working on currently in the studio. And this, this again, I typically don't do this, um, but since we're talking about figures and talking about where art lies in, a, in an artwork, like I said before, the art here is in the, or at least I think the art is in the rotation of the figure, just a simple, almost collage move of rotating that figure. Nothing else has changed about it. And it's that existing in our own uh, up, upright space where the art is located. Everything else is at the service of that one simple gesture, making that strange um, and also plausible. Uh, so I got to thinking again about another self-portrait and though this is not like a, a COVID uh, inspired work, it certainly is appropriate for the pandemic. I just got to thinking about um, the incongruities in aspects of a, a, a person's life, how um, you could feel out of sorts within yourself. You know, your, your body, your mind might not align perfectly or um, the conception of yourself might be just completely um, uh, out of step with other people's conception of you. So it was sort of getting, getting having that, that general sense. And so this was the, the initial collaged version of the work. Which, which is typically how I work. I work with a collage at first, and just to see if the idea makes sense, if I think the idea is plausible. Um, and I live with that for a little while. Uh, and then make a slightly better collage. And then here you see the head is just shifted off the body to the left. And here you see that same figure, the head is just rotated. I think there are lots of ways to iterate this, I, I think with different standing figures and whatnot. But this is the one, excuse me, we're currently working on. So here I'll show you, that's the cast body using the same uh, clothes and everything. So that's the cast body, that's my, my head done in, in silicone. It, it has obviously no hair yet, um, but that's the head we'll use, that's the neck we'll use. What you're not seeing are the arms and the hands. 
I guess if you're on Instagram, you can see all that stuff, but you won't get to hear me talking about it on Instagram. So there you get a sense, again, like those inverted figures of just, just a simple gesture and nothing else done to this thing, you know? And that's, again, no narrative, no, no jokiness to ingratiate yourself with the viewer, <laughs> um, no stylization or at least as minimal stylization as possible. I know that, that, that to absolute neutrality is impossible. But again, a very straight, clean thing. Uh, and so this is the other version of the head just shifted off the body. I think this, this when I look at it, confuses my eyes. And I know that that's a good thing. When I look at it, I know that that's a good thing because I also know there's no trick involved. It's just a shift. You know, it's not, I'm not Evan Penny. I'm not painting this thing in 3D or something like that. This is, this is, there's almost no artistry in it. It's just a, a conceptual intervention. Very simple. Um, and I like, I like when my work takes on an artless quality. Um, and so there you see the head. Uh, again, this is, there's no hair in, it, it put on. So you, it'll have eyebrows and it'll have uh, uh, eyelashes and stuff. But this is pretty good. And I think that's it. That's the end of my lecture. I hope that made sense to any, some of you guys. Um, and I think that there might be some questions. Hi, Tony. Hi. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you being here and sharing all that with us. You know, imagine if I did, if I did the full lecture, we'd be here another hour. <laughs> <laughs> <I gotta... laughs> well, um, I do have a few questions for you. Yep. So the first would be, um, can you talk more about in your sculpture um someone else also had this question and just added in that they were curious about the separation where the separation is from rendering and making everything so specifically but using found clothing rather than also making the clothing mm -hmm. mm. that's a good question um well i i very rarely found objects although strangely i haven't thought of the clothes as a found object uh, i obviously should um that makes perfect sense um but mostly everything is rendered i know in total torpor mad malaise the sheet is real and the cups on the ground are are actual cups they're found objects so i guess what it is is if it's if it if for me if it's the main point of the sculpture uh, it needs to be rendered. If it's, if it's really peripheral, then I can get away with not doing it. Um, and I don't know if that holds up to the logic test, but, uh, but it makes sense to me. Um, I just don't see the, the necessarily the upside in, um, making the clothes. Um, however, as I was saying before, I do believe that an object goes like with the meathead, for instance, or, um, or, or many other things. Like, uh, if I'm making a sculpture of, uh, of, um, what's another thing of the box, let's say it's important. I make that box. It's important. I make that meat because I believe that, um, that you can feel that it's, it's not a real thing. You could feel that it's, you could feel that it's removed from our typical reality. Um, you could feel it is occupying a different space than the real object would. Um, and again, I think that there's a, as I was saying before, there's a kinesthetic understanding your body comes, um, your, your body comes to with the work itself. It's not, I don't know even know if it's an intellectual thing. I think you just feel that it's different. Um, I remember thinking about like um, the Char Charles Ray's tractor and it's painted 
the the painted tractor. I think it's called Dad. I think the sculpture is. I'm, I could be wrong. But anyway, it's a giant tractor blown up from a little toy tractor, and it's all um, made of CNC'd uh, stainless steel, solid, and then painted. Now, standing in front of that thing, you have no idea that it's stainless steel. You just know it's a painted object. It could be plastic, for all you know. But there's an understanding you come with that to, to with that work, and it becomes a different object when when you know it's stainless steel. And again, I know that that's an intellectual thing, but your body feels it differently when you're in front of it. It just there just is a transformation that otherwise wouldn't be there. That renders it, it removes it from reality and puts it into the realm of of um, of philosophical speculation it becomes an object of speculation not just an object and i think when you look at my things you know you know they're made first of all you're reading a materialist and you're coming to my show you know stuff is getting made uh but you could also see it and you could also feel it um so for me i think i think it's important to have that material shift and that material transformation because i think it transforms the the thing itself um and and uh, I don't know if that's that's true for everybody, but but um, but for me, I I feel it when I'm in front of a thing. And another another reason is that uh, another reason it maybe talks more directly to the idea of craft or the degree of production in my work that it does to this question specifically, is that I want the work to be difficult to make, and I want I want that to be true. I want it, I want that to be conveyed to the viewer. Um, in a way because i want them to take the work seriously and a lot of times in that earlier work it was a, maybe a little jokey or a little cute um or the idea was maybe maybe simpler um and the way to convince a viewer of my seriousness was to um to use production value um to convince them of that to just show the hours that went into the thing in a sense um, now I'm more interested in erasing all of that. Uh, I care less about that um, because I think the the work is um, more serious anyway now. Um, but I but I always thought that there was a there was a moment in my life where I needed to convince a viewer that what they were looking at was was made with um, lots of intention, and um, it was convincing them of that intention that that that. Um, that, that was important. And I thought the craft and the, the transformation of materials helped in that. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question is, um, this person would like to know how abandoning narrative coincides with your definition of the work just being an image for the viewer. Is it to ask the viewer to infer a narrative or to encourage the viewer to abandon the evaluation of narrative, especially giving, um, given their changing context and physical locations of your work. I So the reason I was so interested in narrative to begin with is like some of my very early art um, loves were, were uh, like Hogarth and Bruegel and these kind of um, satirical, allegorical painters where you would you would see the work and there'd be so much in a painting you know you could you could read you could literally read the painting on the top left they're doing this and then those people are running over here and they're playing cards and then those drunk guys are falling down the stairs over here and you can literally go through the entire painting and be completely captivated and sucked in by it and that was so fun and exhilarating and also coming from my um, background of of gaming these figures were always imbued with a kind of narrative, you know? So that was really natural for me. Uh, and I really, really liked that. Re I liked reading paintings that way. And I liked reading um, sculptures that way too. Like lot, pl plenty of sculptures operate in, in that same way. But over time I became, it became clear to me that that was, just wasn't necessary. If the, if the work itself, no one ever takes that narrative back home with them and thinks about it. It's not the interesting thing about the work, you know? So what's interesting, the interesting thing about the work is the strangeness in the work and the, the way a work can live in one's world 
and also live in a in a an other world, a psychic philosophical world that is strange and interesting. So I did, I I just came to realize that that narrative was su superfluous and also not not the most interesting thing that an artwork has to give. So I I just I just abandoned it. Um because because a sculpture doesn't really do narrative very well anyhow. Um narrative shows you something, you know? The, a sculpture of a narrative is a is like a cop with a with a billy club like this and a and a guy on the ground like that. There's there's nothing exciting or interesting to take from that. All you're doing is seeing it, you know? Um, so, so it doesn't, it doesn't really add up for me. There was no, there was no point for it. The thing that is interesting about a sculpture is how it exists in space, what it does with space related to your body and how, how that thing inhabits um, not just your world, but a psychic world at the, at the same time. So, um, so that's how I came to, uh, become disinterested in it. Okay, great. Um, so another question that we have is, um, was the new objectivity a German art that arose during the 1920s an important movement to your early and formative years? Yes, 100%. Yeah, and and actually, those those Ivan Albrechts are like really out of that too, like like um, Christian Schad and stuff like this. That was all really really important to me. Okay, we have a couple more. Who questions. asked that? Who's the who's the smart person who asked that? That's funny. <laughs> That's a strange question, but but um, because it's not really evident in any of the work, uh, as far as I can tell. So I mean, maybe maybe here and there, but but that was that was. Um, and that was a very, very major touchstone for me and, and still is something that I think about a lot. Um, I did have a couple of questions um, that wanted you to talk about why you represent the body. And um, it was mentioned that you stated you weren't interested in the figure and possibly what you meant by that. And this viewer also stated that you described the Josh sculpture as not having a style and the viewer would like to know what you might've meant by that. So a couple of different questions in there if you wanna. Okay, that. So, so when I say I'm not interested in the figure, maybe that's misleading. Um, I'm not interested in the figure in the way a figure sculptor would be interested in the figure. You know, I don't know if you guys understand that distinction, but I just, I just, um, not that long ago, did a talk at the um, New York Academy. It's called the New York Academy. I think it's called the New York Figurative Academy. And those guys care about the figure. You know what I mean? They care about the way muscles move. They find lots of beauty in it, uh, and and presumably lots of meaning in that stuff. Um, I I don't care about that. Um, and when I look at when I look at my career, I, I hope this lecture wasn't misleading because when I look at my career, I've made a bunch of figures, but but only like one a year. Um, so and I make a lot of other things during that year. So it's not my primary focus, but it is um, I think something that makes me somewhat unique, um, especially the focus on self portraiture. Uh, but. Um, in focusing on it for this lecture, I, th I thought it was it, it was a way of illustrating that shift in interests, you know, because we're still talking about a figure, but we're talking about representing it and doing, uh, representing it in a very different way with a very different attitude. So when I said I wasn't interested in the figure, it means that I'm, I don't study the figure, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's not, um, I'm, I'm not like uh, I'm not Ron Muick, you know, I'm not like a fetishist on, on this stuff. The, the craft even doesn't really interest me all that much. Um, it just needs to get the job done and that's, that's good. Um, so I guess, I guess that's what I mean by, by that. I think lots of other things can do what the figure can do. I think it's just a very efficient way of talking about 
um, talking about things. And I, and when I make artwork, I'm interested in communicating. Um, I'm interested in communicating internal feelings and, and moods and, and um, that, I, that I have personally some like there's a kind of romantic drive to what I do. And I just think that it's the best way to communicate that stuff. Um, and it's not the only way to do it. And I, I try to do it in lots of different ways, but I like having the figure as an anchor. Uh, I guess maybe in every show, you know, every, every show I do. So I like, I like having it as an anchor there. Um, the reason I thought Josh has no style is because, and again, I, I hedged that pretty, pretty, pretty powerfully. Um, the reason I thought he had no style, again, I'll hedge it again, knowing that there could be no such thing, um, is that it, there is no artistic hand in it. I know I have a certain way of painting the skin that is my way of doing it. I, I understand that. I know that um, hyperrealism is a kind of style, so I get that too. But there's, there's no, there's very little mediation in that work. There's no artist in that work, if you know what I mean, in the way it's rendered anyway. Um, obviously there's an artistic uh, um, perspective that caused that thing to be and caused that thing to be floating and create that, create that image of him. But there's no like, um, you know, there's no brush marks on the arm. There's no, I don't, it's not signed. It's not done in my like signature uh, big eyes style or wh whatever, you know, however you would interpret style. Um, and if someone has a follow up on what they interpret style as, um, I'd be interested to, to hear what that is. Um, but as, as long as I've been working, the most neutral style is one of, um, uh, naturalism, you know, so that, so that's what I'm trying. That's what I mean by no style. Um, I, I always thought style got in the way, you know, this is why, like, for instance, the weed sculptures, they, they are explicitly without style. Although I get that there's, you know, you, you would call them a thing, but calling it a thing is not calling it a style. I call it naturalism. Naturalism is not really a style. It strives to have no style. Um, so the reason for that is that I want a, a viewer to get to the idea as quickly as possible, as, as immediately as possible, without it having to negotiate any kind of mediation, you know, nothing between me and the idea. The same way I was talking about that Dwayne Hansen. When I looked at the Chuck Close, when I looked at the, the Alex Katz, those things all pointed to an idea because you had to you look at this, the flat painting style, the orange color, and the why is the guy standing like that? And why is there, you know, his head's only one brush stroke. So you, you have all of those questions in your head. When with Dwayne Hansen, everything was just completely um, integrated into that one thing. Uh, so that's how, that's what I want, how I want a lot of my work to function. That's the spirit in which it's being created. Um, so that's what I mean by no style. And again, if there's a follow up on that, I'm, I'd be happy to like go down that rabbit hole because because um, I think there's probably some interesting thing, turn, twists and turns there. Let me check, make sure we don't have any more questions coming in or any follow ups. I don't think we do. Tony, this has been absolutely wonderful. It's been great seeing your work. Thank you. This has been very strange talking to myself in the living room, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I've never experienced this before in my life. I have to say, it's, it makes it very, very difficult. But the visits were very, very easy and cool. And this all generally seems to work well.